needs no introduction. He's, he's quite prolific as a speaker, as an author, um, and uh, he is uh, one of our, our uh, superstars. And um, I can't thank him enough for uh, supporting us, um, especially in our time of need. <laughs> and uh, we will rise again, by the way. So, oh, yeah. Dr. Cam Dr. Okay. Campbell. Um, no doubt about it. Integrative medicine is, a, is yeah. the up and coming thing. So, right. you're going to do great. <laughs> organization and I congratulate you for for leading all this and and having having to deal with all the the uh, issues with it good we'll call them issues <laughs> so okay um, I'll let folks in as they show up and um, you <clears throat> take it away. Um, those who aren't familiar with you just give yourself a brief introduction and we'll, we'll take off just let me know when you want me to start start Good evening, folks. Um, it's nice to be here. It's wonderful to be here back again. But wonderful group of folks. And um, my name is Andrew Campbell. I'm an MD. And I've published over 100 studies, about a third of them on molds and mycotoxins. I also have chapters in medical textbooks on this. And, and that's why I put on there based on medical and scientific evidence, not on at, you know, things like anecdotes and things like that that are found all over the internet, unfortunately. Um, and I'm gonna start by showing you this. This is what I, some of what I do. Um, a lot of positions in uh, medical journals and uh, et cetera. And I write a lot of articles too, as was said. This is the important thing right here. Um, the important part is um, um, how do you solve medical problems caused by toxins? Well, one, it, this is not a big mystery. Detect the cause. Second is remove the cause. Third is repair the damage. And then you have a happy and healthy patient. So um, I teach it. Uh, various universities uh, before before the uh, pandemic it was uh, I was actually there this is Oxford University in, in the UK and Harvard Medical School now of course everything is virtual most of everything is virtual so um, remember these three things this is what your car mechanic does but it works in medicine for toxicology as well as well detect remove repair Let's talk about the brain. It's the only organ completely oh, surrounded and protected by bone. I don't, know. I don't know if I'm strong enough to make it down here. And um, um, as a result, it's, um, uh, it uses, uh, it weighs only about three pounds, two pounds, 2% 2 of our body weight, but it uses 20 to 30% of the calories we consume. And because through the, carotid arteries and the vertebral arteries, it gets the, the most oxygenated blood emerging from the heart than any other organ. It's a very important part of us. And it uses 20% of the oxygen absorbed by the lungs. The hourly blood flow through the brain is 13 gallons every hour. As, as we live, 13 gallons of blood goes through the, uh, the brain, 20% of all the blood pumped from the heart. Um, there's all, over 400 miles of blood vessels, most of them cap capillary because each neuron brain cell needs to receive oxygen and nutrients. So these 100 billion neurons, how do we reach them? By having 400 miles of uh, capillaries through the brain. Um, every person's thoughts, every person's emotions, memories, actions, reactions are in the brain. The, um, where do mycotoxins first affect the body? It affects it in the brain. And that's the overwhelming medical and scientific evidence, uh, brain and nervous tissues. So mycotoxins destroy brain cells 
by dysregulating the mitochondrion brain cells and cause cell death, cell apoptosis, apoptosis, and they destroy, mycotoxins destroy the blood-brain barrier so that everything goes into the brain that shouldn't go into the brain. Um, what are the neurological effects? What affects the brain? Well, we get autism spectrum disorder, decreased uh, short and long-term memory in children and, adult, and adults. We get optic neuritis from the demyelination and we get chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. That's also called CIDP and it's very, very similar to MS, multiple sclerosis. We get loss of balance, facial pain, ALS, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis. By the way, on multiple sclerosis studies from um, Rutgers University in 12 years ago showed that this show, this is about 60% of MS is caused by mycotoxins. And uh, recent studies, what I mean by recent is the last in this year, 2022, um, showed that patients who have ALS have um, in every an autopsy on every part of the brain, fungi, molds, same with Alzheimer. So we also get movement disorders, Parkinson's disease from molds being affecting and mycotoxins affecting the brain. So what do you do? Do you give them medication, prescription medication for uh, these uh, disorders? No, you get rid of the mycotoxins and the patient gets, comes back to normal again. And I'll be showing you some actual slides. Two important points about mycotoxins. One is a mold that produces mycotoxins doesn't produce one mycotoxin. It produces a series rather than one. It's not a one-to-one. -one. This mold makes this mycotoxin. No, this mold makes these several other mycotoxins. And then um, second point is if a, no, a mold that's known to produce mycotoxins is present in a home or a building indoor space, then the mycotoxins it produces are present as well. Let's take a look at size. Hair is about 100 microns thick. Mold spores, three to four microns. So what, what does that mean, that three to four microns? As they go in, as you, you're in this indoor air environment and you breathe these in, they go to the deepest part of your sinuses and also the deepest parts of the lung where they easily cross um, through the alveoli into the blood and get distributed. Um, exposure to mycotoxins is by inhalation. You breathe it in, dermal exposure. So it, it's absorbed through the skin. The ingestion part is minimal, and there's many studies that show that the microbiome actually detoxifies or lessens the toxicity of mycotoxins. Um, what are some of the misdiagnoses for uh, mycotoxins? Fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome. Chronic Lyme is another big one. People get treated for sometimes years and sometimes intravenously for Lyme, but it's a bacteria. So how many times do you have to treat it with so many different antibiotics? You should look differently and take a look at, does this patient also have mycotoxins? Because the tests cross-react with antibodies to mycotoxins. Depression that's resistant to antidepressants and anxiety disorders. Um, I've spoken to a number of, of uh, psychiatrists who've seen this, who after trying and trying and trying, do a mycotoxin test and it lights up and they start treating the patient for mycotoxins and guess what happens? The depression goes away. Autoimmune diseases, very common. For example, MS we talked about and also um, other diseases, autoimmune thyroiditis, et cetera, all these autoimmune diseases, and there's more than a hundred, can be caused by mycotoxins. POTS 
is, a, is another example. And there's a study that came out two, three months ago that shows this um, by Dr. Tuman and, um, and a group and her group. Dysautonomia as well. Several studies have shown that. And finally, what we talked about already, it causes demyelination. So in the brain, oligodendrocytes make, make uh, myelin. In the peripheral nervous system, it's made by uh, Schwann cells. And both are affected. So you get peripheral demyelination and you get central demyelination in the brain. Here's the uh, Journal of Otolaryngology and Neuro Neurotology's research. And it shows that chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, hyper hypersensitive such as allergies, food intolerance, sensitivities to chemicals at concentrations that everybody else tolerates, sensitivities to EMF, and even to daylight may associate with mycotoxins. This is the test, this is the journal that I uh, just told, told you about, by Dr. Tuman and, and her group. Uh, some of the symptoms experienced by patients with advanced uh, mold-related disease illnesses, such as fatigue, memory, cognitive impairment, and somnolence I, are, are like those reported by silicone breast implant cases. So silicone breast implant cases are very similar because silicone implants may contain molds from the manufacturing process. And I have about 25, 30 studies showing that, that have been published. Um, the neurotoxicity of, of a group of mycotoxins known as trichothecenes. This is T2 and deoxynivalenol. It's also known more as DON. Um, current status and future perspective. This was published two years ago, next month, and shows that they disrupt the central nervous network, including the neuroendocrine and growth hormone, hormone signaling. Notably, the contamination of mold and mycotoxins has been a identified in the brains of, of Alzheimer disease patients, as I mentioned a moment, moment ago. Moreover, uh, DON can significantly affect the normal activities of the nervous system and endocrine system and then cause damage to brain cells. Therefore, T2 toxin changes the cellular structure and function of the brain. So it really hits the brain hard. And here's another quote, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, CFS, my, fibromyalgia, which is CF, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, various types of hypersensitive, all these um, from that study by Dr. Tuman and show this. And then the neurological manifestations of patients with POTS and uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic regional pain syndrome, these are all conditions that are associated with advanced mold-related disorders. So here is another study, the effects of mycotoxins on, micro, on neuropsychiatric symptoms and immune processes. This was published four years ago. Patients reported moderate to severe levels of cognitive, physical, and emotional symptoms, mostly depression. So here's a healthy brain scan. This is from Dr. Daniel Amons. And this is what it looks like. Now here's a toxic brain scan. Can you see the difference? That's why MRIs and other studies like that only show structure. They don't show how the brain is actually affected. Uh, I use brain spec scans a lot in my practice. And this is a study published eight years ago about sleep. Sleep is greatly altered by inflammatory diseases affecting the depth pattern, timing, and duration of sleep and are a re reliable indicator for how bad is the disease. And the common origin are inflammatory cytokines that are released by mycotoxins, especially tumor necrosis 
um, factor and interleukin one. So continuing on, uh, this was a study done with a population of 119 patients, 79 females, 40 males, 20 were controls. And we did nerve conduction velocities, promoter nerves and sensory nerves. And there were three groups that showed mixed sensory motor polyneuropathy in 55 patients, motor neuropathy in 17, and sensory in 27. So as you can see, these really affect the nerves. The other part was there were high levels of anti-nuclear antibodies and antibodies to central nervous system myelin and peripheral nervous system myelin. And the conclusion was that molds and their mycotoxins in water damaged buildings lead to multiple health problems arising from the brain and the immune system, in addition to pulmonary side effects and allergies. And the exposure to these also in, in, initiates an inflammatory process. Well, actually several inflammatory processes. So here we go, MS that I mentioned before. And it's one of the most frequent and severe demyelinating neurological diseases. It affects mainly young folks. Eventually they become disabled. And in this 210 study from Rutgers University stated, we propose here that fungal toxins are the underlying cause of multiple sclerosis. And therefore they can lead to an effective cure. And I can tell you in my practice, I've had young people come in their twenties and thirties with MS. And guess what? You treat the mycotoxins and the MS goes away and they're fine. They, they're, they lead normal lives. And one of the most common mycotoxins to cause MS is gliotoxin. Now, gliotoxin, we're going back to that. This is published three years ago. MS resolution by antifungal therapy. In other words, you treat them for the molds and mycotoxins, compromises a strong evidence that support fungi as a major contribution to this disease. So folks, if you have patients with neurological problems, the answer may be from due to molds and mycotoxins. And we'll go a little further on on this later on. Okay, be careful if patients have, gluteth have gliotoxin antibodies do not give them gliotoxin because it promotes cytotoxicity. It makes gliotoxin even more toxic to cells. And unfortunately on the internet, everybody recommends that people affected by fungi and mycotoxins take, take uh, glutathione. Yes, but not if they're affected by gliotoxin because they'll get worse if you give them glutathione. Um, here's another study from last summer, uh, I mean, summer of 2021. T2 toxin is able to cross the blood-brain barrier and accumulate in the brain. And it increases toxicity in the presence of glutathione. This is evidence that you should not use uh, glutathione in patients affected by gliotoxin it'll make, they won't get well. Here's a different study. Um, this is from uh, 2015, seven years ago. Um, different brain regions, including the external frontal cortex, cerebral, cerebellar hemisphere, all the parts, and in all analysis of brain sections from these patients, 10 patients who had Alzheimer disease, all were infected by fungi. And this was observed in the blood vessels as well that are in the brain. So that's an important finding. Here's an Alzheimer patient of mine, 76 year old Caucasian male, three neurologists confirmed that he has Alzheimer after a number of tests, MRIs, et cetera. 
He doesn't know in his home, which is his bedroom, doesn't know where his clothes are. He always wakes up in the morning, where are my shoes, where are my socks, where are my pants, where are my sh uh, shirts, etc. He can't leave his house because he'd get lost. He was unable to recognize friends or relatives and forgets things constantly. Well, that's pretty typical of say the uh, Alzheimer uh, patient. However, his MRI showed only mild cortical atrophy. So on examination, his uh, MMSE was abnormal. On a neurological examination, he had decreased deep tendon reflexes in all of his four extremities. He had poor balance, his gait was unsteady. When I shined, I used the light to look at his uh, pupils, they were very slow to react. But otherwise the physical was fine. I did a Alzheimer blood screen um, uh, that is offered by uh, Cyrex Labs and it was normal, completely normal. Here's his studies for antibodies, 12 different antibodies to molds and mycotoxins. Just by looking at the colors, red and dark orange, et cetera, you see that he lights up for all of them, all of them on the IgG. What is the difference, IgG and IgE? IgG is basically a toxic reaction in the body. IgE is more of a mast cell activator. It activates mast cells. So this is the before. And eight months later, his MMSE was almost normal. His deep tendon reflex is normal. His balance was much better. His pupillary reflex was normal. His gait was normal. He's driving. He has no more memory issues. He is fine. Here's the after. So I'm, here's the before. And you can see eight months later, the after. That is evidence. Now let's took, take a look at Parkinson's, which is the second, after Alzheimer, the second most common problem that we have in the brain. Exposure to ochratoxin may induce early onset Parkinson's as well as other neurodegenerative disorders. So let's look at another paper published seven years ago, evidence for fungal infection in CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid and brain tissues from patients with ALS. And uh, I'm sorry, this is not uh, Parkinson's, this is ALS. Our observations provide compelling evidence of fungal infection in the ALS patients analyzed. There's actually three studies now that have come out in the last two years that show that five to 10% of ALS is caused by genetic uh, problems. The other 90% is caused by mold mycotoxins. And here's another study. The effects of glutamate expression is important evidence for the role of mycotoxins in ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Antibodies and neurotoxins in blood, cerebral spinal fluid, and CNS tissue, central nervous tissue, and samples from a large cohort of ALS patients. So this is a lot of patients. If, if a fungal association could be confirmed, a treatment for this fatal and debilitating disease could be quite straightforward. Use antifungals. Um, what is the most accurate test you can use for mycotoxins? And which test is used by university medical centers to do research, et cetera? And what tests did the, for mycotoxins did the author, authors of this, these studies use? Which test? There's two, there's blood and then there's urine. The most precise and accurate test for mycotoxins, both IgG, which is a toxic reaction, and IgE, mast cell activation, measurements for 12 different mycotoxins by my microlab. This is what they're, they used and are currently 
using there's three ongoing studies, two on mast cell activation syndrome and one on autism from University Medical Centers using the antibody test from my micro lab. Here's effects of mycotoxins on neuropsychiatric symptoms and immune process. 87 urinary my mycotoxins, no singular mycotoxins or group of mycotoxins was associated with autism spectrum disorder diagnosis in children. However, IgG and IgE levels are a more reliable index of long-term exposure. This is from Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston. So you do the test, what is the treatment? The treatment, and this is the first rule of toxicology and probably this is the most difficult. Get the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient. Meaning if it's in their home, they either have to have it fixed, remediated, or they have to move. And that for some people is very difficult because sometimes because remediation and testing for molds in the home or workplace, any indoor testing is not um, standardized in the United States or in any other country. You're going to get, you do, five, you call five different companies and you get five different uh, bids and five different answers as to what to do. So this is a conundrum for everybody. A person's health though, cannot be restored if they continue to be exposed to molds and mycotoxins. No treatment will work under those circumstances. I encourage you to uh, type in mymycolab.com, click at the top of the page video, and there is our webinars I've given, and there's one on treatment that goes through the whole process of treatment and how to do it, where to get, where to get everything. Not only just give them this, 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 but dosages, how much, where do you order it from, et cetera, et cetera. So the basic treatment paradigm, and I use the word paradigm instead of some other word um, because it changes. If the patient has brain issues, you treat brain things. If they have gut issues, you treat gut issues. It's, it's not a one size fits all protocol that you give a 22 year old female that weighs 110 pounds the same treatment as you give to a 55 year old male with hypertension that weighs 230 pounds. No, first use an antifungal, Spornox, 100 milligrams BID. And this has been shown to be a very safe drug. I get people asking, oh, what about the liver, et cetera. I've seen almost 15,000 patients with molds and mycotoxins in my career dating back to 1990. And I have had two patients out of almost more than 14,000, almost 15,000. One had a total insomnia. She was a 43 year old female. She developed total insomnia. The second one developed gastritis. None of them, and I check liver function tests constantly and every so often, none of them in all these years have had problems with their liver function test. The other part I will tell you is in these patients that I've seen, some of them had at one time or another hepatitis or were heavy drinkers at some time in their life, et cetera, et cetera. Spornox didn't affect them. So the other part, you support the brain with phosphatidylserine, 500 milligrams, one daily to twice a day. And there are double blind placebo controlled randomized studies that showed this helps remyelinate the nerves. Melatonin, three milligrams at bedtime. Yes, melatonin helps sleep. But studies from the University of Texas San Antonio branch have shown that any brain affected by toxins, this helps detoxify the brain. 
The third one is a good B complex, thorough B complex, high dose B complex. Studies at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom showed this, that it was very helpful in 275 patients. And then fourth is nitric oxide, one twice a day. I get mine from a company known as N101, and it works great. They're lozenges. And um, I did a study on five patients with Alzheimer uh, a few years back, and they all had abnormalities, et cetera. They're typical Alzheimer disease patients. I had them have an MRI with contrast so I could see the brain, uh, uh, everything in the brain as far as blood vasculature. The next day they started on nitric oxide twice a day. In a month, I had them repeat the MRI with contrast and had the neuroradiologist compare the first with the last. It was amazing. I haven't published that. Um, and so honestly speaking, it's, um, it's an anecdotal study because it's not published, but that's what I saw because I didn't think that five patients is enough. There needs to be a greater study done on these patients with greater numbers. So what about this phosphatidylserine? The effectiveness has been studied, as I said before, in double-blind placebo-controlled randomized studies. It enriches myelin. It influences the metabolism of neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. And remember, in the microbiome, you derive from serotonin, you derive melatonin. So people who have good serotonin levels are happy people, they're not depressed, and they sleep well. If their serotonin is affected, they're depressed and they don't sleep well. It stimulates enhanced performance on tasks that learning ability uh, 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 tests and short-term memory, they improve those. And compared with placebo, which was ineffective, the phosphatidylserine supplementation produced a significant improvement in short-term recall, immediate memory, vocabulary skills, ability to recall words, attention, and vigilance. Why not use this to help these patients? Melatonin. Recent studies confirm the benefits of melatonin in reducing the cellular damage generated as a result from toxic agents. And these projective effects are apparent when melatonin is given as a sole therapy or with other potentially protective agents. So melatonin's ability to protect neurons from molecular damage due to a wide variety of substances, including mycotoxins, has been shown and demonstrated. B complex, it, it eight water soluble vitamins. The collective effects are particularly prevalent to numerous aspects of brain function, energy production, DNA, RNA synthesis and repair, genomic and non-genomic methylation, the synthesis of numerous neurochemicals and signaling molecules. Furthermore, in human research, Significant proportions of populations in developed countries like the United States suffer from a deficiency or insufficiency of one or more of the B complex. And that, in the absence of an optimal diet, administration of an entire vitamin group rather than small subsets, like just give them this B6 or B12 or this, at doses greatly in excess of the current governmental regulations, throw those out, would be a rational approach for preserving brain health. Um, nitric oxide that I mentioned in, endows brain neuronal networks with the ability to make continuous adjustments to function in response to moment to moment changes in physiological input because this is important because the whole time you're getting input from your eyes, from, from your ears, 
from taste, smells, etc. So nitric oxide signaling in the brain provide a core hub for integrating the sensory and homeostatic related cues, control of key bodily functions, and help improve several neuroendocrine and behavioral abnormalities, all published in peer-reviewed medical journals. Um, so now let's look at body function support. Magnesium. I use um, MagSRTY. Um, I published a study on magnesium 10 years ago, eight years ago or so. And one of the issues of magnesium supplementation is that it peaks in the blood in two hours. And then two hours later, you lose it through urine. So you'd have to take it every four hours. Nobody's going to do that. No patient is going to remember to do that. Mag SRT, and it's, it's by a company called um, uh, Jigsaw Health. It gives you, it stays for eight hours. So I use it twice a day in my patients, morning and evening. And it's great. They tell me within two to three months, they're feeling much better. Vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 is actually a, a steroid, if you really look at it. And you give them, you don't need to give them more than 5,000 international units. They protect the brain, and I'll get into that. And then... Omega Q plus max. That's a formulation developed by Dr. Steve Sinatra, uh, an old friend of mine, I have to tell you that. And he passed away uh, a few months ago. But this has omega in it from squid, not from fish. So you don't have to worry about heavy metals like mercury. Second, it gives coenzyme Q10, which is great for circulation in the heart. And then it has curcumin, as well, which is a great anti-inflammatory, and resveratrol from the um, uh, skin of red grapes, which is also a great anti-inflammatory. Fourth, you give a probiotic, but not the typical uh, probiotic, you know, um, acidophilus and the bifidobacterium. You've got to give them a spore-forming you've got to give them a spore forming bacilli and I'll get into that. And of course, the, the great vitamin C one gram three times a day for reactive oxygen species, which is very high in patients who are suffering from molds and microtoxins. So let's go through, through these. Magnesium is the 11th most common element in the human body. Where did we used to get it from? Well, our predecessors all the way back to Adam would get water from wells. Well, wells in the earth have a bunch of minerals in it. So now we drink water out of a bottle, plastic bottle. So we don't get the minerals anymore. This it, mineral, this magnesium is a necessary ingredient from 300, for 350 enzyme systems. So it, it's, it's, and then very important in the role of the body's metabolic processes. And 80% of the population is deficient in this nutrient. And additionally, magnesium binding sites have been detected on 3,751 human proteins that are essential for building, repairing, and maintaining the cells in our bodies. It's a cofactor for adenosine triphosphate. As we all remember from uh, when we were students, this is, plays a role in energy metabolism and the processes by which the body breaks down proteins, carbohydrates, and fats and converts them into energy. ATP is the energy currency of the cell, the primary product made by your cell's energy factories the mitochondria. Magnesium is a required cofactor for vitamin C, activating one of the most important antioxidants for the body and support of the immune system. Magnesium is also a cofactor in other nutrients, including zinc, 
potassium, vitamin B complex, calcium, and vitamin D. Without magnesium, it would be difficult to absorb these and have the body use them. Um, vitamin D, very helpful in cognitive impairment, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, and other conditions that develop because your brain cells are not functioning well or because of brain cell apoptosis, cell death. And low levels of vitamin D are associated with increased cognitive impairment, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and respiratory issues, respiratory diseases. And I can tell you in about 80% of my patients, I always check vitamin D levels, 80% are low. You want them to have between the, the number between 50 to 80. A lot of them come in with 20, 30. Omega Q plus max from squid, DHEA and EPA gives you L-carnitine, curcumin, coenzyme Q10 and, as, and resveratrol as I discussed previously. Probiotics. So Dr. Simon Cutting at Reading University did a study for the Food Safety Authority of the United Kingdom. That's their, the uh, UK's FDA. And it showed that the less than 10% of the usual commercial strains of lactobacilli and bifidobacterium in probiotics are able to get to the colon. colon. Actually, he showed that less than 10% make it through the stomach and it's because they, the stomach acid kills them. And then uh, University of California Davis in a publication looked at 16 probiotics produced uh, from, from local stores. They went and bought these and to check if the strains claimed on the label matched those that were found in the capsules. Only one out of 16 actually matched the label claim. And some products, there was pill to pill variation in the same bottle. There are no studies that show that 200 billion CFUs are more effective than 10 billion and that 15 strains are better than five, et cetera. Why? Because they all die in the stomach anyway. Not all, 90, over 90%. Vitamin C. We don't make it and we don't store vitamin C. So we must get it from an external source. Most, almost all fruits and vegetables contain some quantity of vitamin C. It helps in depression, especially in children, reduces uric acid levels for those patients who have hyperuricemia, gout, and reduces the risk for brain cancer, gliomas, and it lowers lipids. Wonderful. I take it every day. Um, so let's look at itraconazole. Itraconazole versus fluconazole. This was a study published 18 years ago. So prophylactic fluconazole prevents candidiasis. There's two types of molds, single cell, which are yeasts, and multicellular, which is stachybotrys, penicillium, aspergillus, etc. Fluconazole only works for yeasts like candida, has no activity towards multicellular molds. And itraconazole provided better protection against invasive mold infections. That's why I recommend itraconazole. The um, brand name is Spornox. How do I see my patients? How do I try to get all this put together? I use a patient questionnaire as a tool. The first, it's 14 pages long. And that is what I have a new patient fill out. The first two pages are symptoms commonly found in patients suffering from molds and mycotoxins. It's all their symptoms. And then on the left side column, they have to score it from zero to 10, zero being none and 10 being really bad. On the right hand column, they have to say how long they've had this symptom. 
And, um, and patients fill it out when I first see them. Then when they return, I only give them the first two pages of symptoms. And it's a quick glance to see and help you who are treating the patient, where have they improved? And where do they need further improvement? So here is the questionnaire. As you can see, these are all the symptoms on the first page. The severity, zero to 10. And when did you first notice this symptom? So it's a great screening tool. And I'll be happy to send it to you. Just shoot me an email. Important. If you test positive for mycotoxins, retest after six months of treatment, not before and not after, six months of treatment. You saw how I did that on the patient with Alzheimer. Binders, they're very popular on the internet. However, animal studies in pigs, rabbits, sheep, broiler chickens, ducks, turkeys, rats, and mice have shown that binders, specific binders may remove mycotoxins under certain precise laboratory conditions in these animals. Remember, these are all laboratory tests, so they, they measure it out very carefully. However, there's no medical or scientific published studies in humans, what does that mean? We don't know which one to use for which myco mycotoxin and what is the dose and how long you should take it for and what are the potential side effects. But it's all over the internet, but it's all anecdotal. It's all so-and-so had this happen and so forth. These are not acceptable as medical and scientific evidence. Um, this is a common, I get about five to 10 emails a day from patients, and this is one of them. My functional doctor uses Shoemaker protocol, which most of them use. It didn't work for me. And that's why I found your article and contacted you. After two and a half years of her doctor trying to heal her gut, she's not satisfied with her prior treatment and not addressing the mycotoxin candida SIBO effects. And the doctor prior to this one that she saw for two years, so now she's sick four and a half years, who was very knowledgeable in mold illness, only treated her with cholestyramine and the VIP, the modified Shoemaker protocol, as well as some supplements. It just doesn't help them. It takes me six months to eight months, depending on the severity, to get a patient back to normal. Um, more of the same. I've been dealing with mold toxicity and trying to get to the bottom of everything because I'm not getting any better. I was blown away by your thoughts on binders because they're pushed by pretty much everyone. I've been taking them and haven't seen much of a difference. Now, here's these tests that lack any medical evidence. Urine testing for mycotoxins from an indoor environment, they test for the mycotoxins in the foods you, you eat. The oat cell test in urine for moles, the HLA-DR genetic test, the visual contrast testing that you do on a computer and it tells you about if you have mold or not. None of this has been proven in any way, shape or form. MSH, C3A and C4A. I can tell you as an immunologist and toxicologist that these are C3A and C4A are just inflammatory markers for any disorder, for any kind of problem. Uh, they're not specific. So I've been told by many doctors that urine test always has ochratoxin. So what is the source of mycotoxins detected in urine? Why is the detection of mycotoxins in the urine not an indication of new antigen formation between mycotoxins and human tissue antigens, which cause autoimmunity, that play a role in the pathophysiology of autoimmune neuroimmune disorders. This is because the mycotoxins detected in urine originate from food. And this is why the detection of mycotoxins in urine is not an indication of body burden of mycotoxins and should not be used as a biomarker of exposure to mycotoxins and molds in water damaged buildings. This, by the way, was stated by Dr. Um, Gujdani. 
So serum blood testing for antibodies is highly precise. It tells you if you have mycotoxins from a moldy indoor environment. The urine test changes because it measures what is being excreted from foods, not from the indoor environment. It can change day to day, week to week, et cetera, et cetera. The oats testing, organic acid tests measure levels of organic compounds in the urine. Um, it's used, I remember when I had to do a rotation through neonatology for three months in my residency, <laughs> used to check for rare inborn genetic defects of metabolism, most often in newborns. It doesn't say anything about molds and there's no evidence that it says, do this test and you get something, it tells you if you have molds or not. There's no evidence of that. If you want some more information of all this, and I know I've barraged you with a number of things. Um, if you want a copy of the patient questionnaire, or the latest study, uh, this is with, I did this study with Dr. Weinstock, who is the professor of medicine at um, Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we published this in March of this year. Molds, mycotoxins, the brain, the gut, and misconceptions. Also, I mentioned to you Lyme in the past, early on, and for this, I would recommend that you read this study and I'll be happy to send you this one and the previous one, Lyme disease and mycotoxins, how to differentiate between the two. This was published in, in the summer of 2019. I received notice in January of 2020 that this was one of the 20, 10, I'm sorry, one of the 10 most read studies of all studies published in 2019. So not because I'm a great author or anything, heck no. It's because people, doctors, clinicians, people who see patients have a trouble differentiating between the two because many of the symptoms are similar. And lastly, for any references, I didn't wanna put on, I usually put on six to 10 pages of references line by line. So there's quite a lot. I just so thought I'd, if, if you want a reference for a particular thing, just email me and I'll send you the reference or references and help you. Um, uh, and then if you want, just email me and I'll help you with your patience as well. So I'm concluding this and um, uh, I, I wanna answer certain uh, questions that came up in the chat. Do I have a different treatment for the mast cells or do you just treat the molds? No, they're different treatments, but the treatment is slightly different, not hugely different. Uh, intravenous ozone. Again, this is a evidence-based lecture. There is no evidence that intravenous ozone is helpful or not. The third question is such as bacillus Coagulants, yes. Bacillus coagulants is a spore-forming bacilli, bacillus. And so, yes, it is very helpful in the gut. And let me tell you, I've seen many patients with who come because of irritable bowel syndrome, SIBO, and all these things, and they get treatment for those. No, treat the gut with the spore-forming bacilli, and those things will go away. Um, so is LDN helpful against molds? I'm at the risk of repeating myself, there's no studies that show that LDN is helpful or not. And I have to base everything on medical evidence. Is there any difference between extended release melatonin? No, it's just plain melatonin. The other question is, how long is Spornox used? And this is a very good question. What I do with my patients, and remember, I've got many patients, 30 years experience. I ask them a very simple question. Four letters, four words. How do you feel? Not how you're doing, how do you feel? When they come to me and say, I feel pretty good, I stop the Spornox. 
Usually it's about a six months treatment. So, um, but it's a very good question. Um, how do you check the house? Mold inspectors. This is what I mentioned before. It's not regulated. So you call four or five different mold inspectors, they give you each one a different story. And it costs a lot of money, unfortunately. Um, why is IgG used? Can it be just old exposure? Well, let me explain a little bit about microbiology and difference between that and toxicology. I, as a kid, had um, small uh, chicken pox. I now have IgG antibodies to chicken pox because that happened many, many, many years ago when I was a kid. Those, there's four, in microbiology, there's four living organisms with cell walls, et cetera, bacteria, viruses, parasites, and uh, pathogenic fungi. So when you have an antibody to those, it means sometime in the past. Now let's take a different tack and go to toxicology. Toxins are not alive. They don't have cell walls. Mercury is a toxin. It doesn't have a cell wall. All toxins are groups of molecules. They're not alive. So the body reacts with an IgG antibody when it's inside you. An example that somebody, um, a, another doctor gave me, he says, that's a good example. He says, because people use shampoo on their hair and that shampoo has you know, 10 to 20 different chemicals in it, but they, don't, they feel fine and they don't show up in the blood. IgG antibodies to a toxin means at that time, your body is fighting that toxin. It is a marker for what we call body burden. And it's a test, the uh, antibody test for, uh, for mycotoxin is a quantitative test, how much of each one you have of these 12 mycotoxins. How did you detox the guy with, the old guy with, micro, with uh, Alzheimer? Again, if you would please go to my micro lab, Dot com and click on the uh, up, up at the top video. In the first row, it'll show you treatment. Click on that and you can watch that. Can mycotoxins be involved in developmental of uh, uncompensated vestibular neuritis? Yes. How do you treat it? Okay, so this is a study I published um, on, on not only vestibular neuritis, but also optic neuritis, several studies that showed how you treat the mycotoxins and this goes away. So how do you treat again? I would recommend, because here the time is too short for me to go over all of treatment. It, you know, um, it, it would take me at least an hour and a half to go through that. And we just don't have um, that kind of time. But um, um, I'd be happy to share that with you. Um, email me, uh, go to the mymicolab.com and click on and, and watch the treatment uh, webinar, um, et cetera. And I'll be happy to hold your hand with any patient. I'm here to teach. I'm an old guy already. I'm happy to teach anyone who wants to know how to help their patients. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, and the question here is the last one, six months of Spornox can kill the microbiome? No, not at all. Uh, six months, a year, two years, three years, four years of treatment with antibiotics for Lyme, that'll completely wipe out your microbiome, okay? Um, another question just popped up about patients won't get better because if they're still in the moldy environment, they are living in it or they're working in it. How do we get familiar with making sure they're no longer exposed? Well, one thing is the issue of do, by asking them, is there any mold in your home? And remember folks, today we have not one bedroom in a house. We have several bathrooms, I'm sorry, we have, we don't have one bathroom, we have several bathrooms. We have dishwasher in the house. I have a refrigerator that spits out um, ice and cold water. And I, there's, dish, there's a uh, washer and dryer in the house. All these things, places are potential leaks. 
where that water will eventually grow mold and from the mold mycotoxins. The way I explain it to patients is mold is the gun, mycotoxins are the bullet. So how do we, how do you make sure one is to get, find a good company that tests for molds? And I have several published studies on what, how do, how these things happen, how do they occur, et cetera. And so um, you, if, if the patient, and I've had patients who come from Louisiana, from the bios of Louisiana, who, who live around mold and were born around mold. And of course, for them, it takes them a little bit longer to get well. But um, um, there's two companies that I recommend um, so that if you would please write me, email me, I'll give you the name of these companies that um, I use. I, I, I bought a house a few years ago. I moved and bought a house and I had them come out and test the house as part of the inspection process before purchasing. Believe it or not, they missed the mold. I had a friend of mine who was the mold inspector who I will share with you. He told the inspector, did you find any mold? No. He says, come here, look at the refrigerator. He opens the half door to the refrigerator on the second, second and he turns on his, his phone and with the light on it and shows him mold growth. And he says, oh my gosh, I didn't see that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's now been an hour. Um, I'll be happy to entertain any more questions via email and uh, share with you what I have learned over the last 30 years. Thank Dr. you very much for having me. I appreciate it very much. Are you staying, Dr. Because we want to have some discussion here. Is that okay, Dr. William? It's oh, fine. sure. Okay. Yeah, just to spice the conversation here and, and, and uh, really... I do that in my room, so I think Dr. William will be okay as well. Your presentation is excellent, it's great. I like it every time you present with your approach and methodology and um, you know the way you lay down the whole uh, protocols and the pathophysiology and you bring all the chemistry as well. But the question is that is fungus infection is a cause or a risk or a trigger? And, and that's the question we need to make sure we have the clear answer. So I want to ask you that and then we will see if we want to analyze it and 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 brainstorm it because there is many different um, aspects of it. And I just want to analyze that and, and discuss it with you. So the what is your... versus the trigger is basically the same thing. What causes something or what create or 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 triggers a disorder or disease is the same question. What triggers autoimmune disorders or what causes autoimmune disorders is the same question about molds or mycotoxins. The issue about a, a, a chlorine dioxide solution, methylene blue, uh, medical grade uh, hydrogen peroxide for blood enrichment and cleaning, et cetera. I've seen a couple of studies, but it, there's no real good studies using a number of patients other than just a kind of a uh, a, a pilot study. So, you, you, so I, I would hesitate to say, yes, use this and it'll be wonderful and you'll feel great because there's not enough medical evidence on that. Okay, so when you say it is a uh, trigger is, is a cause, you know, we have also something that's called genetic. You know, if we have uh, a nursing home and it's infested with, uh, with fungus infection, and not all the patients there, all the people there got Parkinson's disease, but few of them. Um, can we say the reason of those patients has Parkinson's disease, it's because of the fungus infection? And if that's the case, well, there's a lot of their peers there and same age and maybe same risk factors, and they don't have Parkinson's disease. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, fungus infection, yes, it triggers. Um, the inflammation and maybe the progression, but you still have to have some background of genetics that leads to that person to be having Parkinson's disease. Do you agree on that? Or you wanna say it's absolute cause even studies, without genetics? Yes, studies and, and I can, uh, actually I did a study on this and published it uh, seven years ago. 
um, in uh, the uh, journal called uh, Autoimmune Diseases, it was a review studies, showed that ge genetics plays a small role, but not a big role in mycotoxin related disorders. One thing is, is mold, which is, a, a, which is alive. It's a, a, or, a living organism. And another thing is a toxin such as mycotoxins. So um, we, as I've shown you in, the, in, this, in this particular um, uh, program, is I've given you the actual studies that show what mycotoxins can do. I showed you the one about ALS, um, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, and I can show you many, many more. I'm just limited by time here. So let me go back to Parkinson's disease. In order to have a manifestation, a manifest of patient with Parkinson's disease, uh, clinically, they have to have almost more than 70%, maybe 75% of their dopaminergic neurons completely dead, or you can, we can give us some percentage, like let's say 50% dead and 25% stunned, okay? And what we do and what we see and what we observe is that those patients, they come clinically as Parkinson's disease, and then we give them IV glutathione, we give them possibly antifungus, we give them all this antioxidants and things that we're doing, which is creative things, and possibly we say this is mycotoxins, and you see the patient is improved. It does not mean that you reverse the 50% death of those dopaminergic neurons. It means those stunned, inflamed dopaminergic neurons, maybe they, they, they return their function and that you can see the improvement, but it does not mean that we are reversing the pathophysiology of, uh, of the Parkinson disease because there is underlying genetic problems that is causing the, the Parkinson disease, that's causing those an ability of those cells to detoxify themselves and, and buffer the redox and, and that leads to induces of apoptosis. So there, so we, we cannot just say fungus is the cause, absolute cause of Parkinson's disease. There is genetic there and the fungus is a trigger to as a part of inflammation, uh, induced inflammation that, that may stun those, those cells or possibly causing them to, to die and, 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 and speed the progress of Parkinson's disease. Can we agree on those things? We can agree that the medical literature provides the evidence that's medical and scientific. And I would have to see medical and scientific evidence that this is based on only genetics and nothing else, or only uh, molds and mycotoxins and nothing else. Everybody has an immune system. Everybody's immune system is unique and different. And the studies that I review, I'm the editor in chief for three medical journals. I sit on the editorial board of another five. So I get studies constantly every day. And I look through them all, especially as it directs to these neuro, neurological diseases. And I have the evidence shows what I discussed. Phenomenal. Uh, you mentioned the autism. And if, if you're the same Dr. Campbell, I have a patient who told me that their autistic child started speaking after a Dr. Campbell prescribed itraconazole for five months. I'm in Melbourne. I don't know if you're the same Dr. Campbell. I can't imagine there's too many doing that. Um, actually, again, um, look at the studies coming out of, of Tufts University School of Medicine. Look at the studies coming out of um, University of Helsinki. Look at the studies coming out of um, uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, those studies, and they, these, none of these are, are brand new studies. These studies have been around. I have treated for the last 30 years, autistic children. And my first study, uh, published study on autism was back in the 90s. So it's, it's, it doesn't come from something relatively new for me. Mm -hmm. I'm also publishing a study with um, uh, a, a group uh, on autism uh, using uh, mycotoxin antibodies as a marker, as a biomarker. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it, it's stated neurodevelopment, neurodevelopmental orders and um, disorders in children behavioral disorders in children, 
ASD, Asperger's, all these complex things that we have seen that have increased um, over the last several years. And they go back and doctors are saying in, in these universities that a lot of this is due to climate change because of, look at the floods in Florida. Look at what happened in Pakistan last month. Look at what happened in Australia. All these countries are, are, have issues with flooding, et cetera, into public buildings, homes, schools, et cetera. And then you get mold growth. Schools are especially susceptible because they're, they're built to the, the lowest bidder. So they're notorious. And the University of Connecticut has published an, a whole big chunk of articles on uh, uh, how teachers get sick from molds and mycotoxins and how that is an occupational hazard. I gave a lecture on uh, a webinar on autism um, uh, in April. It's also available on the mymicolab.com website under if you click on videos, and it's only on autism. Yeah. For instance, uh, mothers, pregnant mothers who live in a mold, moldy environment, they find mycotoxins in the amniotic fluid in those mothers that have choked their, their, the fetus has genetic and mal, uh, um, abnormalities and malformation because many of these tox mycotoxins are, can affect that. Why? Because it affects DNA. As soon as you affect DNA, well, you know, you affect all of that. I did, again, another webinar on mothers and children the first thousand days, because then it goes into, if mothers are around it, it gets secreted in mother's milk. Mycotoxins get secreted in mother's milk. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Um, does the degree of improvement after treatment uh, rely on the duration of this, the disease? In other words, is that a matter of diminishing returns uh, if they have prolonged disease. What I can tell you is in my experience, some patients, okay, every patient being different, you get people who are very healthy, choose their food carefully, exercise, do all the necessary things. And then you have the people who get sick who are also couch potatoes, don't exercise, don't watch what they eat, et cetera. So obviously all those things affect whether the, how quickly or how slowly a patient is gonna get well. Um, you know, I've had to talk to um, all, all patients from all walks of life, um, as you can imagine. And I treat patients internationally. I, this week it was Latvia, London and a couple of other places. And again, they will respond differently according to their nutritional status. Any comorbid factors, are, are they diabetic? Do they have cardiovascular disorders or anything else? What, what medications are they taking prescription drug wise? All those things interplay with this. I've given you a general idea. Okay, so uh, what would you say in order of importance uh, would uh, then uh, duration of the uh, disease be uh, then uh, perhaps uh, general health and uh, then age? How would you say those are, what would be the relative importance of those three things? Well, they're all important. Again, okay. every patient is different. Um, so you know, really, you just then have to do what you do, uh, encourage them to be more healthy uh, or have, have healthier lifestyle, uh, and then just depend on talking with the patient to see how they're improving. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Not only that. 
but you 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 have to look at all the different uh, flavors and varieties of people. You know, um, did they when they were growing up? Did they did they do things that were naughty, such as use uh, certain street drugs or not? Yeah. Did they drink too much uh, at one time in their life or not? Um, all those things play uh, a role in in all that we do. In every. <laughs> Lastly, the examination of the patient. You've got to examine these people carefully. It's not the quick. Um, I, I mean, I, I went for my annual checkup. My examination took under three minutes. <laughs> you know, that to me is not an examination. My new patients, I spend up to two hours with them because I want to look at all yeah. their medical records. What are the tests that they've had in the past? What was, did, were they a, a C-section baby or were they a, a natural birth baby? Because that affects the microbiome. Yeah. For example, in natural childbirth, the water breaks for the woman and that coats the birth canal with mother's bacteria. So the first bacteria in the baby's mouth is mother's bacteria and it helps prepare the gut for the, their microbiome. Once born by cesarean, the bacteria in the mouth are from instruments or personnel in the operating room. And that gives you, that's why children with, from cesarean sections are prone to uh, milk intolerance. And later on when they're three to seven years old, more commonly have allergies, all relating back to the microbiome that was formed at birth. Actually in mother's milk, first day of mother's milk is very special milk. It produces certain anti um, immunoglobulins to protect the child, but it also has some polysaccharides that the gut of the baby cannot digest. It goes on to the gut and helps form the microbiome by giving those bacteria down there in the gut food that they can use to grow on. Okay, thank you. Sure. Dr. Campbell, I, I just wanted to ask a question. Thank you so much for your um, presentation. But um, I had heard actually on a gardening podcast that they were talking about using um, fungi against other fungi. Um, and this made me curious about if you've had any experience with or read about somebody using that specific thing. like. Okay, so we know we, you probably have this kind of mold or exposure to it. And now you have mycotoxins. I know you couldn't get rid of necessarily the mycotoxins, but they were even saying there were mold, different molds that would actually clean up the mycotoxins. Really? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. called magic mushroom. No, ma um, mountain mushrooms. I can't remember. It's in North Carolina. And they, have, they, they were saying that they... Uh, are dreaming of a time when you can actually take an oral swab go like that, send it to them, and they can tell you what fungus they can give you to take care of it. When I hear things like that, the, my first question is, that's very nice. Can you send me some studies that show this is real yeah. and not just anecdotal? Okay. okay, so no, not, not real time yet, right? Right, so for example, okay. you, we all go to conferences and all these conferences have people um, have tables with all kinds of probiotics, right? Mm -hmm. Yet I just gave you the information from studies on probiotics, but they'll tell you our probiotic, oh, it's, it's resistant. The capsule resists the acid in the stomach. I say, that's wonderful. I'm happy to hear that, that your company does that. Can you show me mm. like the old, show me the beef. <laughs> Yes, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Well, excellent as, as always, Dr. Campbell. Um, are, are there I any- think, I think the probiotic that she's talking about, the probiotics are healthy bacteria. And also there is healthy fungus or um, that those healthy fungus will kill the pathological fungus, same like, the probiotics has healthy bacteria that kills the 
bad bacteria. Um, is that what you mean? No, I, I mean that I read Dr. Simon Cutting's studies at Reading University, and they were very thorough because they were paid for by the uh, Food and Safety Administration of the United Kingdom. And they showed which all the different strains, none of them, I, I mean, none of them survive less than 10% survived the stomach acidity. So what they do in the, uh, Dr. Simon Cutting called this dead bacteria therapy. Other studies with Dr. Cutting and others have shown what spore forming bacilli do in the gut for the microbiome. And if you read recent studies, I'm talking about within the last four years about the gut with the microbiome, they actually help detox mycotoxins by oxidation. And these studies are all, and then, you know, I'll be happy to send you the citations for them. And actually um, there, some of the citations are in the publication that I put at the end of my lecture the um, uh, molds and mycotoxins, the gut, the, br the brain, the gut, and misconceptions. So it's all there. It's all medical and scientific ev published evidence. Um, are there any symptoms that are more um, sort of uh, pathogen, magmonic of uh, myco mold and mycotoxins than others? No, because, you know, one of the criticisms is that, well, you know, these symptoms could be, you know, a thousand. Anything. Right. And that's part of the problem of in, in, in medical circles is that, well, gee, you could have just about anything. They all cause these kind of symptoms. And that's true. But this is why I developed this questionnaire 30 years ago to help me get through all that, you know, um, I can't tell you how many fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome patients I've, I've treated who are well. Mm -hmm. They don't have chronic this, chronic that. And um, uh, I've been to, I've spoken at many, many, many conferences over the last 30 years, as you can imagine. And um, a lot of them are about how to correct or how to cure or how to modify chronic diseases. Part of that is what we learn to do as doctors, identify which we think, you know, could be, but there is no specific, this will, this tells you it's such and such for any disease. In your experience, are there any symptoms that, you know, when, when you, when you, when they, when you see them what you know, checked off on that questionnaire or you ask your patients, and say, aha, this is where I'm going, or no. not really, or, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a hormone guy. So, you know, my thinking is always along those, those lines. You're, you're, you know, the immune, you know, you know, mold guy, you're thinking is always along those guys. Do you attract a certain patient that, 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 that it's, it's, it's more likely than not that, that, you know, what your expertise in is, um, you know, is what we're going to find or, or, or not? No, because 99.9, .9, I don't want to say hundred percent of patients that come see me have already seen anywhere from five to 20 or 30 doctors before they come to me and they bring bankers boxes of medical records. They, and they've had the same tests run several times. MRIs runs this CAT scan, all these things colonoscopies, upper endoscopy, all these things many, many times. And then they finally end up with me. I know, so, I, have this, I, I get the same thing, you know? <laughs> so, and I think a lot of people here in our group, I think it, it probably, if you took a consensus, you would probably all tell you this, give you the same answer. I think we're, we're kind of all in that same boat. Um, but- Yeah, we are good dumpsters for other doctors. <laughs> but, I mean, we are uh, good dumpsters, right? Exactly. Um, but for example, um, uh, so I have a checklist too for my, my, you know, my hormone patients and I'm in the thyroid section and I'm not going to really reveal what it is, but there's, there's, there's two symptoms that seem to stand out um, that are subtle, that are not the, the usual thyroid symptoms. 
that when I when I when I when they when 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 I see them checked off or I ask them about it, I you know I know I, I can almost predict. Again, I can't say a hundred percent that you know th this is going to be an autoimmune thyroid uh, issue, um, even if it's it's not been previously detected. Is there, is there anything along those lines in your in your experience? No. Okay. I can also tell you that there's a lot of hormonal studies looking at how mycotoxins affect in hormones, testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, and in particular, the thyroid. Mm -hmm. Right up my alley. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll be we'll, we'll be looking we'll be we'll be looking those those up shortly. Um, but we'll I'll show them to you in in California. Uh, okay, or, you're you're coming to Denver. I'm sorry, not California, Denver. Yes, I'll be yeah. there speaking on Saturday. Yes, so um, like, like, so like I said, so what we're talking about is Dr. Campbell and I are going to be at the AMMG um, on uh, December. No, it's October. It's coming up, right? October twenty eighth to the thirtieth. Right. Um, and um, I, I, I'll be doing um, testosterone complications, which they they made me they made me water it down. Um, what I really my real title is. Nearly everything we learned about testosterone in medical school was wrong, but they, they said that wasn't scientific enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's my real topic. <laughs> and so, um, so um, um, I look forward to it, Dr. Campbell, as always. And um, I won't be running out to, to OMED in Boston because as I told you before, they, as you all know, they threw us out. So uh, no need to aggravate ourselves over that anyway. So we'll be hanging around. So anybody else have any, any other questions? Um, uh, hey, we, Dr. Campbell, I just wanted to tell you, I looked on their website because I knew something was like catching in my brain. Um, they say they do myco remediation too. So even if your patient like found mold and they didn't want to move, they actually will test it against some of the other mushrooms and molds that they have and see what will kill it. And then they can actually apply it and get rid of it. So anyway, just throwing that out there, even if it's not for treatment for them, if their house or something like that. I thought it was so interesting. Interesting. Okay, talk amongst yourselves. I'm getting somebody's uh, email here. So, uh, okay. So Dr. Uh, Campbell, again, thank you so much. Anybody else have any comments, questions, um, complaints? Uh, <laughs> I just want to add something about, uh, you know, your antifungal drugs. In addition, it is um, killing those fungus infection. Most of the antifungal drugs are also anti-inflammatory drugs. And they inhibit the TH17 and leukin 6 which is, the, that, that's a good thing about those antifungal drugs. And that's why we use it for cancer. It does inhibit the interleukin 6 which is part of the pathology of cancer as well. Um, There's several so the question so, uh, is, Go ahead. The question is, is that, so when you're treating those patients, uh, killing those fungus um, with the antifungal drug, but also you are reducing the inflammation. So part of your treatment is killing the fungus, which I think it's part of the pathology of triggering those progression of those um, autoimmune disease or degenerative diseases, but also you have very good uh, uh, anti-inflammatory antioxidants which is the magnesium, uh, um, the vitamin C, and then you are replenishing the damaging myelin with phosphodiol uh, or the phospholipids. And then you're also adding uh, uh, vitamin B12, which helps also in regeneration of the, of the neurons and the myelination part. So, you know, it's, it's more of a healing part that you do anti-inflammatory antioxidant. Um, so that's, that's antifungal drug that you're doing is just not just killing the fungus, but it also has anti-inflammatory part. In yeah. India, when COVID-19 hit and the COVID virus is like fungus, um, it's different from many other viruses. Most of the viruses you'll see the TH1 response, but the COVID in a certain way, it, it pushed things into, T, into TH17, into leukin 6, so they have high into leukin 6, and that drains the immune system and put them at risk of the black fungus infection. And the way that they, they're effectively treating it using Matlam Blue as an antifungal drug. 
killing the fungus and also metlambu inhibit interleukin-6. It works the same like the drug antifungal that you're using, the big pharma one. But I, I favor metlum blue because it does not interfere with the mitochondria. Actually, it, 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 it enhances it. It does not, it is very compatible with the biology versus any big pharma products, including antifungal drugs. But in India, they did very good in, in, in managing black fungus with, with metlum blue. And I know that you're looking for publication research and all that stuff and to justify adding it to your protocol. But we already have a lot, some, some clinics here and, and, and many others are doing it, IV and all that with great success. And possibly it can be a replacement for an antifungal. Uh, in addition to metalum blue has, it promotes the mitochondria, it, it has anti-inflammatory, it's antioxidants. And in addition to everything you add, made from magnesium to vitamin C to B12, um, to alpha lipoic acid, to all that, those, those very powerful antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. But I think in addition to that, I think Dr. William Bill will say, well, we need to also restore the, um, the, the hormones. And I think those patients, they will have low cortisone, they will have low sex hormones and restoring that would definitely uh, help to speed the process of, of healing. So this will, we can combine the effort of Dr. William and, and, and both Dr. Kemble where they can work as a team and, and they start learning from each other and make possibly combining their protocols. But I think it's very critical that we need to restore the hormones. What do you think, Dr. Campbell and Dr. William? I think that uh, antifungals, in particular, itraconazole has been shown to be effective against certain kinds of cancers. Um, and we also know that fungi, um, uh, I'm not fungi, mycotoxins are known carcinogens. Um, that's been known for 30 years, probably, or, or even longer, actually, 40 years. And I think that uh, if, if uh, clinics are having wonderful success using this or that, that's great. Um, and it's anecdotal. It's just like if I say to you, my uncle Ralph went bald for molds and mycotoxins, and then he used um, olive oil on his scalp and all his hair grew back. That's very nice for uncle Ralph, but that doesn't prove to me that that actually is works for everybody. So this is why we need good studies to show us what what works at what dose, how often in what patients, does it work in young, old, patients with comorbidities or not, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, ditto. <laughs> so, um, so um, one other, maybe it's a little bit off topic, but um, so we see a lot of, a lot of patients that with chronic sinusitis um, they've been on a lot of antibiotics, and um, I, I, um, I've taken to using I, I, atraconazole and a, and, a, and a steroid to make it into a um, an, into a nose drop. I mean, I don't really, again, I don't really have anything to to hang my hat on except that you know they've had years of um, uh, chronic sinus issues, and uh, even have a positive a CAT scan, and um, a uh, uh, you know, they've been on six, seven, eight rounds of antibiotics, and and they don't get they don't get any better. Um, and we do see seem to get get um, you know in some of the patients. Um, um, is there is there a um, is there a swab that can be done? Is there a you know? A, Here's what you, you just gave out a study that was done by Dr. Ponikow, chairman of the ear, nose, and throat surgery department at the Mayo Clinic. He took 210 patients, took them to the OR. They all had chronic sinusitis, had been through the usual rounds of decongestant antibiotics. And then a month or two later, they're back with the same problem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He took these people with chronic sinusitis, cleaned out their sinuses, sent whatever he found in that gunk and sent it to the lab and asked them, what, was, what did you find? 96% had mold. So he actually asked that the term chronic sinusitis be changed to chronic fungal sinusitis and the treatment he used, and that's been now, that was a 1999 study. So you're right on the dollar. <laughs> and uh, he actually showed that um, itraconazole um, orally and amphotericin B um, nasally in a spray uh, helps those patients. Since that study, it's other, Medical centers have shown and and mm -hmm. 
agree with that. So you're doing the right thing, Dr. Bill. Yeah, that, that came from some A4M lecture many, like many, many moons ago. So I can't even remember who where it came from. That, but that that's one that always sort of stuck in my mind. So so for the rest of us out there, so chronic sign patients with chronic sinusitis and on lots of antibiotics. Um, you know, it, it's to me, it's a, a fungal infection until, until proven otherwise. So correct. Well, actually, what happens is, and it was described. What happens is, is that sinuses are are essentially um, coated with mucus cells, and when you put some thing inflammatory like mold spores on them, they make more mucus, and then they cover the mold with this mucus. And then what comes on top of the mucus? Bacteria. So yeah, the bacteria will help it a little, but then it'll come right back eventually. Right. So uh, that's, that was shown. And also what has been shown is that what happens with those molds and they produce mycotoxins, it get, they go through the cribriform plate and into the brain. I've heard that too. Okay, so that was my two cents on uh, on molds anyway. Um, so um, anybody else have any other? Oh, there's one question here about something about Saccharomyces boulardii is good for mold against mold. No, it's a yeast, um, okay. and it's going to be killed by uh, itraconazole. It's a yeast. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a single cell mold. Okay, and I like the way you don't equivocate. The answer is no. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, okay, anybody else? Um, I'm gonna let Dr. Campbell go. It's uh, where are you? are in Mexico, you said. I'm I'm right now treating patients until uh, day after tomorrow. Oh, okay, all right. So uh, we'll let you we'll let you go and enjoy the rest of your life or your nice your night here and your life too. Um, we'll see you in a couple of weeks at at, at AMMG. Um, if you have any influence at A4M, they don't seem to like me anymore for some reason. I don't know. They, they don't. They don't want me anymore. So I'll put it in the book for you. But, but yeah, okay. And we were supposed to have Dr. Pam Smith next week, but she had a um, a, a conflict. So we're going to have her. Uh, I think in December. Um, we're going to have Dr. Goodno next week, and uh, I for, he's new to us, and I forgot to write down what he was talking about. So anybody who knows who he is, um, let me know. So I'll, I'll get in touch with him, and I'll get it out this weekend. Uh, you know what what the topic is. So, um, and uh, anybody else? Any questions? Uh, going once, going twice. Dr. Campbell, we can't thank you enough for your time and your expertise. Um, it's always great hearing from you. Um, and thank you for supporting us. As as you know, we've been we've had a bit of a challenge in the last this last summer, um, but um, we're regrouping. Um, we have everything in place now for um, uh, to to. Uh, to uh, and and I, as you've been getting my my the our flyers for the last few weeks, we we using the moniker American Osteopathic Society of Integrative Medicine. Um, we're an official uh, FBI IRS approved um, uh, subspecialty. We're uh, registered in the state of Nevada as a uh, nonprofit organization, and we're, okay. we're ready ready to go. Um, and uh, so we're going to apply to the AOA as a subspecialty, and um, uh, their attitude towards us uh, up till now hasn't been too positive. But we'll we'll keep we'll soldier on. And uh, with that, anybody else have any comments, questions, um, complaints? Dr. Burgess, you have anything for us? Everything's beautiful. Everything's beautiful. And if anybody has two million dollars, we're going to purchase a, a healing property in Hawaii. So all us crazy people like Dr. Campbell and yourself can come join us. It's time for a healing center. And uh, anyway, I don't have the 2 million and I don't have the time to sell my stuff if I had any. So if any of you have 2 million, we need to put a, a healing center together. In Hawaii, there's a place and it's doubtful this opportunity will come up again. So if you know of anybody, I'll send you the MLS bill and uh, anybody who wants it, they can have it. They can... Uh, Keep it, give it to their family or their friends, or we can all work together and make this thing a happening place. By the way, it has a huge waterfalls and a stream going through it. So we could do horticulture and we could do the uh, primitive stuff too. And I'm pretty primitive. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but 
there's there's a hospital near but very nearby at Hilo. So if we wanted to do the straightforward research and medical stuff, we would be welcome to do that as well. That's all. Thank you. Hey, Thank Dr. Campbell, you. Dr. Campbell, you're a cool guy. Thanks for sharing with us. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yet we, we don't we don't hear that praise that often from Dr. Burgess. So uh, um, uh, I would go to the Hawaii for swimming. Is there next to the beach? <laughs> no way. It's it's all a secret, by the way. Yeah. But yeah. now all you guys know. Hey, Just thanks. I know we're keeping Dr. Campbell. We gotta let him rest. Okay, thank you. So thank you. And thank you for yeah. all your work, Dr. Bill. Okay. Oh, there's a question here about uh John from uh from from Brad Stoker. PayPal or Ven Venmo for the two million dollars. Uh it's up to them. I don't have a dog in the race. I just hope everybody does well. But I see this is a I thing think, we can do. I think that do. one went over your head. <laughs> uh, it probably did. I don't know about that stuff. I, think, I don't know anything. I, think, about, I don't know anything Ven, about money. I think you, I'd prefer Venmo. PayPal will take take a take a percentage. Venmo's more. So. Okay, Venmo. You guys. Okay. Decide. okay. All right, everybody. Uh, good night, Johnny. Are you going? Are you going to Elmet? John, are you going to Elmet? Yes, and I've infiltrated several groups, so we will be there in force. Okay, all right. So, all right. Let me know. We'll 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 uh, we'll uh, subsidize you a little bit. So, all right. Thanks. I, as you know, I've, I've I've elected not to go because it would probably just aggravate me. Oh, we got it covered. We got it covered. We got your six. All right. Good. Okay. All right, everybody. Good night. And uh, I think uh, we're we're looking at uh, Joel's uh, stash of mushrooms here. I think that's what this is. <laughs> So, um, okay, we will see you next week. Same time, same station. Good night. Thank you all.